Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again in another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. This is another episode in our prequel series for Horror on the Orient Express. Will this week's investigator please introduce themselves? I'm Martin. I'm playing uh, Richard Courtney, and he's from the southwest of England. So he'll he'll try and talk posh. He'll try and talk properly, as he's been taught to. But occasionally, he's probably just going to sort of slip more into the his kind of normal rhythm and uh, perhaps not pronounce things as, as they should be pronounced. And uh, yeah, he's going to slip a bit and start uh, start slurring things together and that kind of thing as you do in the West Country. So he's an interesting chap. Uh, Richard was born and raised in Cheddar. And Cheddar is a small village in the Axbridge Rural District in the county of Somerset. And Somerset is some 18 miles southwest of Bristol, uh, or Brizzle, as uh, some of the locals might call it. Uh, Cheddar being the place where the uh, the cheese is made, which is why the uh, the place is famous. Uh, he was raised by his parents on a small dairy farm, and the farm is just east of Cheddar. So Cheddar itself is a um, you know a village. It's quite a um, not not somewhere you're going to have a, a farm in the middle of. Um, but he grew up on a, a small dairy farm just east of Cheddar. The farm's fairly traditional, being in the area that it is, so it's it survives on a reliable income from milk production. Richard's father's attempted to diversify into some other areas, so things like strawberries, believe it or not, uh, were, were quite popular. Uh, cheddar, and he's also tried a bit of cider as well. Unfortunately, those ventures were never very successful. Richard's father, Mark, is quite an affable person. He's built a reliable business on the back of some excellent long-standing relationships. So he's a real people person, is Mark. But he's loath to really go too further, uh, too far of, uh, away from his, his local area to, to, to promote his goods. So Richard attended a local school up until the age of 10. He was fairly socially awkward. Uh, always preferred the company of adults. They seemed to make more sense to him than, than a lot of the kids. He never really got a lot of the games. And he was much more uh, comfortable around the, the company of adults. He was lucky enough at that sort of age to be sent to what he calls proper school by a, a friendly benefactor. There was a a professor who had some relatives in the area when you were a bit younger, uh, before you'd gone off to what he would call proper school. His name is Professor Julius Smith. So he is a literary PhD and he ran into you and your family at one of the local markets initially. And he noticed uh, how sharp you were. And he took up uh, a bit of a banner for you in that regard with your family and told your parents that you would do great at a school that was more your speed and that the local schools here couldn't provide you the education that someone with your intelligence would need. He doesn't feel very traditional as far as a professor goes. He's generally very affable. He's not close-minded in any way. He's adventurous, at least in your younger years he was. He came and went quite a bit during your schooling period, but he made sure that the financial portion of it was always available uh, through his work. He did a lot of work uh, in your early years through the British Museum, and he would go on digs, and rumor has it that he was all over Europe. But he truly became more than just a benefactor. Professor Smith is you know, a great you know, whiskered man at this point. He's coming up on his 60s. Um, but he has become, in your uh, professorial years, your own teaching years, he's become a font of information about how to teach. And while your subject focuses might differ, he is never far from uh, lending a hand when it comes to the fine art uh, of teaching. Uh, he's lived and traveled extensively. Uh, his specialties mostly are European languages. Um, so he is mostly a linguist and a literary professor. Uh, although he does smoke 
a pipe quite a bit. You've done your best to uh, get past the smell of the specific obsidian-hued tobacco that he uses. He has a residence in St. John's Wood uh, when he's in London, so he's in a fairly decent area. Uh, he spends most of his time lecturing at the University of London uh, or reading, doing readings at the British Museum. He is probably not only your best professional contact, he's probably one of your closest friends. Yeah, no, I think that, that sounds perfect. He did suffer in 1919. You would know this because it was you, you would have yeah. been there. Uh, in 1919, he lost his wife. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they married but never bore any, any um, children. Yeah, um, perfect. And he has had a couple of interests after that, just simply nothing that, as far as you know, that has gone anywhere further. It, it seems that he's a, he is very much his own man uh, as far as his time and his work. And that is what is most important to him. Yeah. And I think Richard's probably emulating what he sees in Professor Smith to some degree. So I think he's very driven, very motivated to, uh, to succeed. And I think in part, Richard's own passion and enthusiasm for his work is, you know, really just to pay thanks to to Julius Smith and uh, and his parents. You know, he's always received a lot of praise for his work, his intelligence and uh, school work, that kind of thing. And I think part of repaying that back is to do well and to uh, be someone that uh, his friends and his family can be proud of. Richard would have gone to Clifton College. So Clifton College is a boarding school in Bristol. You know, he was very happy to be admitted to that college, to be able to study science, did really well and uh, still still socially awkward. But uh, I think the people around him had some degree of respect for, you know, the fact that he was quite, quite bright and, uh, and generally left him alone. He wasn't bullied. He was, he was quite lucky in that regard. Richard started to wonder how all this sort of stuff worked. He started to find patterns in things. So where there were formulas for things, he'd sort of he'd find it quite interesting that you could explain things in nature um, with mathematical formulas, so he, he started asking questions about you know the natural world around him, and wondered if he could apply some of those models to those, which was an entirely different way of thinking for him. So ev- everything he looked at, he was you know what makes it tick, why does it work, why does it work that way. So after doing rather well at college, he sort of got to the point where he was really interested in the mathematics behind it. So he decided to start reading mathematics at King's College in London. As I say, he's always been very focused on his work he's very keen to please people socially awkward sort of chap currently he's a lecturer he's he's finished his research degree he's been awarded a professorship i think staying at london for him was a very a very logical choice that's where pretty much everything was happening and i i get the impression that unless you were studying at either oxford or cambridge that you know neither of them would be particularly interested in taking you unless you had some sort of stellar career so I, I think for Richard, I, you know, and given his background, I mean, he didn't come from from money. Getting into to King's College was was really good for him. I just don't think that he would have made it outside of there, and, and I think that was that was his decision. So he decided to stay there, carry on with the people that he knew, and uh, yeah, um, did his research degree and uh, and is currently teaching. Okay, so where do you think Richard lives within London? I mean, he's not particularly rich, so I'm going to suggest just the other side of the river. Foxhall's a good place. I'm sure there are many professors there with more money, better family connections, and, and much nicer places to live, but uh, that isn't Richard. Richard would like to, you know, he's not uh, not particularly money orientated, but uh, I'm sure he'd like to live somewhere slightly better than Vauxhall, but uh, that's what he's got. So what we'll do then is we will open our first scene at King's College. It's a relatively brisk January morning. It's about mid-January. You just finished up a lecture, your morning session. And as the students are filing out, you catch sight of Professor Smith, who is walking with a reasonably sized uh, case in his hand. Not like a briefcase, it's more like a box with latches. He nods at the students as they go. They they don't know him by any means, but he gives off a very professorial air. And so most of them are, you know, head down, trying to get, not be in his way. He makes his way down the lecture hall. He seems to be genuinely in a good mood. <clears throat> Professor, he uh, chuckles. Oh, how are you? 
I'm absolutely fine. How, how are you, Professor? Doing well. I'm doing very well. I hope I'm not interrupting. No, no, not at all. Just, just finished. Um, you seem to be somewhat burdened today. <laughs> Ever so slightly. He uh, sets the box down on the wide table. He turns around and seems to glance over the lecture hall here. And he waits a couple of heartbeats. And you see the last student finally collect themselves and leave the room. And then he turns back around. I hope your uh, <clears throat> studies here are treating you well. Not uh, not too bad at all. Good. Good. I wish I could come to you with this at a better time. Oh. He taps the box for a moment. Recently unearthed. He uh, begins clicking and popping latches and whatnot. It's quite the, the object. Something far more uh, towards your proficiencies than mine. He lifts the top of this black case off and you see underneath of it underneath that case cover you see a wondrous brass object. It's an object that you're somewhat familiar with although uh, it doesn't appear any way like you have seen them before. You're familiar from a mathematical standpoint of what a sextant does. Uh, so you can see uh, the different parts here are present um, you can see that it has a nice rigid brass frame uh, you see that there's an index arm you know what they're for while never per say using one uh, you are familiar with the, the, the mechanism itself you see that it has the siding mechanism uh, a horizontal mirror uh, there isn't even appears to be a telescope but that is where its familiarity with the sextant, a regular one, ends. There are all sorts of different arms and armatures that spindle off the mainframe. Uh, in an array of uh, dizzying lenses, you see four or five or six different colors, even for lens holders without lenses. He ever so slightly puts his fingertips on the rim of the bottom case as to not even touch the object. And you can tell that there is a quite a bit of a trepidation when he touches the box. A few months ago, I assisted with the identification or attempt identification of this object. A third party firm was doing a dig in Upper Greece. He um, takes his pipe out. And you can smell, like as soon as he actually takes the pipe out, it's not even lit. There's a very familiar scent. I believe it was just north of Edessa. It was unearthed in a cave system there. When they removed it from the cave system, they cabled me immediately. I took a train down and began my uh, cursory examination of it. Have you ever seen anything like it? Well, I mean, I'm certainly familiar with the sextant. Um not much of a nautical man as you know um it's quite fascinating all these additional appendages i mean i can't imagine what they're for hmm. neither can i and that is why i'm here i'm not a man of mass but uh, i know enough to know that some of the symbols here and some of the armatures that the movements it could make it, it makes no sense to me no i wonder if they were building on the original concept i mean it's it's possible, I suppose, that you might try and triangulate other things. Um, maybe stars from different parts of the sky. Uh, or, or maybe objects on land. Per yes, perhaps perhaps other objects on land. I, I can't imagine what. He nods, seeming to take your suggestion. I wonder if you might be willing to investigate it for me. Absolutely. Um, it, it's a fascinating thing. Before you jump over the hedge there, I, I, I do want to offer a, a few constraints. He takes the cover and places it back on the box. Go on. You will speak of this to no one, except myself. Okay. There, uh, there is some concern, although I was not aware of it at the time, there is some concern that this object 
may have been removed from Greece without the knowledge of the government. Uh, And while the land there is potentially questionable as far as who owns it, I do not want to run afoul of the government there. It would not be good if uh, my reputation was sullied by it reaching the papers. No, I quite understand. I mean, absolutely, in your field, I mean, if you were to become known to be a, a, well, dare I say a thief, yes, I I could imagine that uh, the digs would become all the more difficult than they are at the moment. Yes, well, the the times being what they are, especially with the troubles in Italy, have not made things easy in that region. No. But uh, it is not all um, strange contraptions. I I have another gift. He tucks his hand into his jacket and removes a carefully folded piece of paper. I was wondering, uh, Saturday, there is a showing at the British Museum, the Maudsley Collection. I wonder if you would join me there for it. Well, I would be delighted, of course. Are you you familiar with the Maudsley? I'm... No, but I mean, the British Museum, it it has a a wealth of exhibits, and I'm sure this would be, uh, yes, very interesting. Well, they're uh, artifacts from the Mayan culture. Ah, South America, isn't that? Mm, yes, he brought them over a few years ago. And uh, the collection is one uh, uh, amazing, uh, mostly from Central America, uh, a bit in the Yucatan and uh, Honduras. They're showing some new pieces on it, and I find it fascinating only because the culture that there is still yet uh, we know so very little about it. Hmm. So very little. And how they came to build these temples and how they came to create their own culture. It's so much different than ours. Yes, I mean, I've, I've read something of them. Um, certainly some of the architecture is spectacular. And, and I believe someone once hypothesized that uh, they have something similar to Stonehenge. Some, some sort of stones or, or calendar Thing represented in the physical. Um, fascinating. I, I'd be delighted. Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. I will leave this. He taps on the box, and when he taps on the top of it, you see his um, his middle and third fingers uh, preternaturally just kind of clamp around the box and click shut the uh, metal hasps that keep the box locked. Do uh, take care with this, and uh, if you... Uh, come to any conclusions or perhaps even some interesting uh, theories I would love to hear them this weekend mm, no indeed well I shall uh, I shall start by oh I don't know um yes perhaps if I if I draw it out and and, and yes yes leave it with me leave it leave it with me I, it, it, it is certainly fascinating yes now I figured that that uh, you might be the certain type of person to bite at this apple well I mean do you have any idea as to I mean, you said it was found sort of north, um, upper Greece. Um, what, in, in a cave system, was was there anything else discovered with it? Well, there were some papers, and I have them at my residence, and I'm going over them. But uh, unless you read uh, ancient Greek, it, it might be very difficult for you to surmise <laughs> them. I am working steadfastly now uh, on translating them for you, so that way uh, they might be available notes. But perhaps... Uh, perhaps I could have a summary, or at least a uh, better idea, in the next few days. Well, I mean, anything that you you think might shed light on the function of this would be, uh, yes, much appreciated. The cave system uh, is just, uh, as I said, uh, northern Greece, uh, then, and um, there are a series of caves there that it came out of, but uh, it seems to have gone back uh, several thousands of years that have been trapped by a, a shift in the rock patterns there. Mm-hmm. And when this... Uh, digging group was in the area they managed to unearth it and when they found that it was things they could not explain rang the museum and uh, the note came to me i know this is probably a ridiculous question but um do you, do you believe these appendages have been left in their original position or do you think um there's the chance that somebody may have been prodding already or, or maybe yourself to be perfectly honest richard he steps just a hair closer to you um i barely touched it I was concerned. It does appear to be made of brass or some type of metal, uh, although I have done no metallurgical treatments on it as I have not the, the equipment. No. Um, um, 
the only reason I ask, I mean, if we know where the, the device came from, I was wondering whether perhaps it was set or adjusted in a way that would have been significant to the place or, or near to the place it was discovered. That, that might be a, a way in. That would be wonderful. I know culturally speaking, the Greeks used them, obviously, but I would say investigate it and then um, perhaps if you have any initial thoughts, we can speak about it Saturday. Yes, yes, indeed. And and if you find anything in the meantime from your notes, then then please do let me know. Mm, right away. All right, then. Uh, I do have to go see on Beddoes. Um, he mentions Beddoes, his um, faithful butler. He does uh, worry often when I'm not at home. But yes, I shall see you uh, just in a few days, then. Yes, well, thank you once again. I mean, this is fascinating, and it'll be, uh, be good to see you again. And uh, I can't think of anything better than discussing... Um, these, these Mayan artefacts at uh, the British Museum. It sounds, uh, sounds like a wonderful evening. I surely hope it is fascinating. And with any luck, I'll have more good news for you Saturday. I, I look forward to it. He uh, nods and takes his leave of you. And he leaves you alone in the lecture hall with a box. So you wrap up your day at King's College and find your way eventually back to Vauxhall. The box and uh, the rest of your um, professorial uh, accoutrement come with you. And I guess how do you spend your evening? I think Richard would be very interested in this box. He's very interested in his work. He doesn't really go out much. He's got an interest in jazz that he's starting to sort of develop, but uh, hmm kind of involves interacting with people and uh, that's not a terrible thing but uh, I don't think that Richard is going to be able to resist uh, taking a look at this you open the box back up and it sits there still undisturbed in its holder Um, you see what appears to be some sort of simple fabric lining there does seem to be something hard within the box whether it's a wood backing or um, some type of material there Uh, So it is supported. It's not just sitting in the bottom of this box. Although the the box itself uh, doesn't seem to be necessarily common either. It almost appears as if some great care was put into the creation of it. Although it's nature and uh, aging, just as you're comparatively in the two, the box is uh, what you would consider fairly modern. It's just well done. Hmm, Interesting. So Richard all just sort of clasp his hands around the bottom of the instrument and, and lift it up just to get an idea of its weight and its feel. You know, that, that kind of thing you get when you pick something up. The box or the item? Oh, the item. Um, he's going gonna to pick the sextant up out of the box. So you pick up this sextant, and the metal itself, the framework that the sextant is made of, again, it feels just as rigid as it looks. And the metal itself is actually strangely cool almost cold to the touch. It feels like a wrought iron gate, except it's not nearly as uh, dense of a material. Hmm. The index arm, the part of the sextant that would move when you're making your adjustments, it moves freely, but when you move or begin to kind of adjust it a bit, you can see that there are now multiple index arms. So it seems to be as if instead of a couple of calculations that this could make it seems it could make a multitude uh, perhaps two or three times as many calculations hmm. this is fascinating your, your fingers go to the mirrors uh, that are on this device and they're not made out of anything what you would consider traditional as far as mirrors go you don't know if it's polished, high polished silver or if it's some other type of metal but it's nothing you've ever seen before is the, are the mirrors also cold? If you put your fingers on them, then yes. Yeah. Um, you can tell that there is a bit cooler temperature to them. The sextant has those arms and the circle lenses on them. Those are called shades. They're to shade your eye from the direct sun. There are a multitude of lenses. Uh, you count three. And that seems almost too forward thinking for something that is supposedly so old. So what do the markings on it look like? The markings on it themselves, uh, mathematically speaking, are somewhat similar. So the sextant bottom uh, through that frame 
has uh, hashes for distances. That seems to be something you're used to, mm-hmm. at least from a mass perspective. Uh, but the characters that they use are unlike any uh, language you've ever heard before. Hmm, this is interesting. I think Richard is likely to pick up a notebook and start making copies of these these symbols that he sees on there. So you're just going to take it through the motions, so to speak? We'll make some notes of the symbols. Richard might see if he can find something in a library on you know, identifying ancient script or... There may be a colleague, perhaps in the anthropology department, that might be able to shed some light on uh, on what these things are, where they've come from. When he, when he moves the sort of main index arm, does anything else move with it, or are they, do they all move independently? Why don't you make me a power roll? Richard made a power roll of, yeah, 83, so he failed that one. You look a little bit deeper into this, and you begin moving some of the shades and then the index to try to get a better idea of how this thing adjusts. For a moment, you see the mechanics of it itself. What look appear to you to be very basic. This isn't some Victorian sextant, but any um, mechanical apertures to it. Hmm. It seems very basic. You can tell that the the sextant almost seems to shake or rattle a little bit. Okay. Is there anything obvious in the main body of the sextant that, that would possibly rattle? So if, if something rattles, it tends to be because something's loose. So maybe he'll, you know, give give one of the index arms a little shake just to see if there's any play in what might be a, a gear or something like that. It looks like where the telescope site meets the center of the index arm, that's where the rattle is. We're going to have to get in there with a tool then and try to get in and tighten it, but it's going to be definitely what you would call up-close work. Yeah, so I think uh, Richard's a fairly cautious, risk-averse chap, so Richard's going to look around his uh, his apartment for a, a magnifying glass. I'm sure he's got one somewhere. He does like to examine things, and he's got a microscope at home. I'm sure there's a magnifying glass somewhere in the kitchen drawer. Yeah, absolutely. You find one. In fact, that's an interesting idea. So um, Richard will grab a candle and light it. He's going to see if he can... uh, Yes, that that might be interesting later. But he's just going to take a look with a a magnifying glass and see if he can see where this rattle's coming from. You look deep down into the main portion of this frame. You start seeing points of multicolored light from within the frame. It's almost as if there's a, a deeper opalescence to this when you look at it closely. You take away the magnifying glass for a second and check it again. It looks quite normal, just as you'd seen it before. But as you continue to look deeper at it, there is definitely something more to this frame. Hmm, this is fascinating. So Richard will take the, the candle and hold it up um, to see if a bit of direct illumination will, will help. Uh, maybe maybe the light from the room's otherwise not quite right. So maybe, maybe this this you know, taking it close to the candle and having a lot look might uh, might sort of help. I wonder if it'll make a power roll. And that's a hard success. So it is. You draw additional light to it, and as you draw additional light to it, you see something move along the frame. Light itself moves from the left hand side of the frame up towards the center area and then down to the right. And this sextant frame opens into two pieces. And you see that on each side of this frame, which is now unfolded, almost like a butterfly's wings, there are multiple telescopes. Almost as if it's a pair of oddly created field glasses. And you see that the shades, there are so many on each side, now can be fanned out and moved. Wow, this is absolutely fascinating. I've never seen such a thing. I, I can't imagine what this is for. So does, does what he's discovered look like it's the, the sort of primary purpose of this instrument? Uh, and I guess that's the wrong question to ask. I mean, Richard's sort of interested to see whether the, the other parts of the sextant that were visible before this opened were just there as some sort of obfuscation to hide its its true purpose. I mean, does do those things almost sort of 
fall to the side in a way that renders them almost useless, or, or does that still look like an integral part of the, the sextant? It almost seems to fall away. What begins to kind of bubble in the back of his mind is that this is it's something hidden. It, it's almost as if this is much like what he'd encountered as a young boy. Things were presented that others would add on to and that this path that he's illuminated for himself is something wholly different. He's going to draw himself a nice cup of tea. <laughs> he's going to he's going to sit back and just ponder on what on earth this object might be. Why so many shades? What would they be used for? Why why would you need something that's that adjustable? How many different parameters of something could there be? Per- perhaps it's for stars in the sky? Or you know, beams of light from somewhere? As he's making his tea, he's gonna gonna take the candle and he's gonna position it sort of around just to see if there's a, any incidents between some of these light beams. So do you know, do, is there some sort of light path created through some of these mirrors and shades that yeah, he's just gonna just gonna see what happens. During that investigation part, he's gonna have to probably pick it up and hold it up because obviously mm. if you're viewing things through it, the what you would view things through would be that a telescopic part of it. So each of the lenses, right, there appear to be on the left hand side a pink one, a blue one, a green one, and uh, yeah, and a yellow one. And then on the right hand side of it, there is a black one and then a cracked lens. So there's one of the lenses is, is cracked, it seems to be clear. Mm-hmm. And then there is one that is missing a lens. There's a bit of tarnish you can tell on the shade holder. And so maybe uh, it could be some sort of salt corrosion or something. Peering through it just a bit, uh, as far as the shades go, uh, you can tell that the candle color changes every time you put the device in front of it. So there's four on one side and space for three, though one's cracked, one's missing on the other side. Does there look like there was room for a fourth on the right-hand side or not? It does appear as if there is a room for another one on the right-hand side, but it's missing. So could he sort of, for example, move the pink one from the left side to the right side? It appears anyway that you could move them on the left, but you can't move them over to the right-hand side. They appear to be fixed on that side of the sextant as it's unfolded. Um, there's no way to really get one from one side or the other without dismantling it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think he was just looking for natural movement. You know, is it was it adjustable enough to move left to right and left, uh, right to left? Sure. Um, that doesn't doesn't look like that's the case. So I think he's gonna possibly just hold this, pick pick this thing up with two hands, hold it in front of the the candle, and look through it as if as if it was a pair of glasses. So maybe with the the pink lens on the left eye and the the black lens on the right hand, uh, the right eye. So you put those lenses in place and you hold it up to the light and to see through the telescopic pieces. And what happens then is rather remarkable, if not a bit heart-stopping. The device, this strange sextant that Professor Smith has brought you, seems to adhere itself to your face. And you see through those telescopic sights into your home. But when you view your own residence, you see it as if it was built uh, in an era which you don't live. So this would be a pre-Victorian image you begin to get. Um, You see a different family living here, moving about the room. You see things from 50, 60, 70 years ago. As you see this image, it begins to have another image overlaid it. And you see sitting not far from um, the fireplace, a older woman who is has a blanket over uh, her legs. Her form is rather translucent though. And even as the uptick again in your heart rate begins, you can tell that there is something 
different about this family. They are not reacting to her. They are not talking with her as these moments tick by fast, as if she's not there. And that's when you come out of it and you see the sextant having reclosed is in your hands. The tea next to you is cold and you're not sure what time it is until the clock on the wall rings eight. My word, what on earth happened there? What did I just see? And Richard's just going to put it calmly back in its, its place in the box and he's going to reflect on this. And he's going to pop the kettle on again, um, put it back on the stove, and uh, have another go at a cup of tea. You can't help but shake a bit when the, the kettle goes on. But what we'll do is, we will leave Richard right there, waiting for the next cup, and we'll see him when we start up. Fantastic. Fantastic.